Good morning, Lisa. I'm happy that you can join us today. Lisa is a co-founder and CEO of Genet Medical, as something Samsung Catalyst have made an investment for their Series B round. And I'm happy to meet Lisa as a part of our Samsung advisory board regarding the importance of genome and what it can do for our health. Now, genomics as a closely related field of personalized medicine has moved to the forefront of health care in many ways. Uh, and I understand that it's helping us with preventive care and therapies for chronic disease, such as heart disease, providing reproductive health counseling, screening, care for both infertility and re newborn genetic disorders, and developing advanced therapies for disease, such as cancer, and monitoring and treating infectious diseases and global outbreaks. With all that, I am really excited you can join us to talk about where we are. Could you share a state of union, union, not in politics, but where the promise of all these things are mentioned earlier? Yes, fantastic. First of all, thank you for speaking with me this morning, Young. It's fabulous uh, to be here with you. So there is a lot of complexity in our genome. There are 3 billion base pairs. And what is known as causative of disease, um, initially there was a lot of focus on the protein coding uh, genes that are implicated in health. And we now have about 5,000 genes that we understand what their function is and how variations or mutations in those genes could lead to disease. Uh, and many of these are uh, conditions where they have a different degree of penetrance. It could put you at a you know, 30% lifetime risk or an 80% lifetime risk because a lot of disease has not only factors from our genome, but also you know, lifestyle factors and other environmental factors that can lead to disease. So where we really started in the study of, of genetics and genomics, and in particular, I'll focus in on genetics first, which is, you know, relates to the DNA we inherit from, you know, our, our, our parents. And that is really where what we call monogenic conditions, where one gene can lead to, a, a, you know, a change in, in, in how uh, you regulate, and that can ultimately lead to disease. In fact, there's over 100 genes that um, have an important uh, cause of our risk for cancer. So we use genomics really for prevention as well as diagnosis and determining treatment options. And virtually everybody in the population would benefit from access to these genetic insights that can inform our clinical care. And it really is the building block for both precision medicine and value-based care. So not only does genetics offer the promise of getting you know, the right therapy to the right patient at the right time, but it can also ultimately, we believe, lead to improvement in cost savings in healthcare because at the highest level concept, you're bringing new information to better inform care. And so that means that individuals uh, with the highest need get access faster. So it's a very exciting field and lots of new innovation coming to the forefront, new assays being developed, uh, new tests being brought to market, but a lot of complexity around this. And so where we are in terms of the State of the Union is that we have the medicine, we have the science, we have the technology, but the vast majority of patients are still not getting access, even when it is medically indicated, even when it is covered by their insurance. Uh, there's just barriers in access and just clinical understanding broadly. Yes, thank you, first of all, explaining to us the complexity of human and the way we are and the biology. There seems to be a lot of data that's going to be coming together. And uh, uh, given just a number of the discoveries that are happening, are there ways to unify that information so that it's easy to consume? At Genome Medical, we're focused on not only having the clinical knowledge and expertise to be able to support uh, the complexity of genomics, but we also are building the digital infrastructure to make genetics and genomics accessible to the masses and to really bring this into primary care as well as specialty care. And so the, the structure 
structuring of data and the sharing of that data is one important pillar. Another important pillar is providing the clinical support tools to non-genetics professionals to know, you know, which patients would benefit, what tests to order, and how to interpret and use the resulting information to guide clinical care. And so we are building the, you know, SaaS platform to enable not only that ease of access for patients so they can come to Genome Medical, self-refer, schedule an appointment, see an expert within days, you know, learn what's important for them, whether or not might be covered by their insurance, um, and take them through this entire care journey. And I just might note briefly, we are now in network for over 100 million covered lives. So as part of that, a third of the United States can just come to Genome Medical and it's covered as part of their, their care plan. Um, but the other side of that equation is the support for providers. And so we've really applied this partnership with hospitals and health systems and providers to you know, be that uh, expert on demand when needed, but to also provide the clinical tools and support providers so that they're increasing their knowledge set and increasingly, you know, utilizing genetics and genomics as appropriate for their patients. And that's really the big win because we want to elevate everyone's knowledge and start to increase adoption much more broadly. So one of the uh, quandary of healthcare system, in particular in the U.S., was that the patients, the providers, and the payees are somewhat independent. Uh, how do you connect them so that they can all with the same motivation? Obviously, what you're trying to do is more proactive and trying to take a more preventive step and uh, making sure that uh, there is the right incentive system to making sure that people are providing tools, diagnostics, and the uh, data that can be able to help them to do the right actions before become an onset and later stage problems. And is that, do you think, it sounds like it is, you are making progress. 100 million is a big number for coverage. Yeah, we've definitely, I think of ourselves as an ecosystem player. So we, you know, support uh, the goals of payers who are at risk for, you know, covering uh, health care for their members. And the reason payers bring us in network is because we can, you know, identify which patients need genetics, get to the right test fast and the first time around and then know how to use that information to now change clinical care. So the the ROI on that investment of bringing Genome Medical in network is very clear and you know over 5x. And so so that helps on that payer side. Um, on the you know the the health uh, providers or health system side, um, there's also value because to build up the expertise that we have present at Genome Medical, you know we have a very large clinical team, and so there's there think of it as how do you bring that available on demand when needed? So you may not need a full time metabolic geneticist and you know, uh, sort of on your staff, but you want access when needed. Otherwise, you end up referring your patients out. And if you're referring those patients out, you're largely referring uh, to leading academic centers, which is where genetics and genomics exists today. And that means that you might lose that patient for the their full you know, continuum of care. So it by, you know, sort of supporting Genome Medical or our aim at Genome Medical is to really bring genomics out into the community setting. So every hospital and health system has access. And that's important because 80% of patients are seen in the community setting. They don't make it to the leading academic centers typically. So, so in the early days of genetic testing, which mainly around cancer and uh, prenatal natal issues. But now I think there are more and more uh, tests are branching out to areas like cardiology, endocrinology, nephrology, and neurology. And how is that going? Is it very early stage of that? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I mean, it, that is one of the huge opportunities and also one of the complexities. So you take something like, you know, urology and, you know, most urologists have not had, um, you know, strong use cases for ordering genetic testing in the past. And now, you know, any metastatic, metastatic prostate cancer patient is uh, recommended to have uh, genetic testing. And so that means you now need to elevate the knowledge of all urologists on what to order, when to order, what is appropriate. Um, and that's just one example. Ultimately, this touches all you know, pediatricians, all oncologists, all cardiologists, all neurologists, all urologists, you know, the, the list goes on. And so the, the challenge is that as things move into medical management guidelines and reimbursement coverage, the last step in the process is typically physician adoption because a lot of physicians you know won't adopt until you have reimbursement coverage and medical management guidelines in place because then it's really standard of care and so even when you've established this standard of care there's still years of gap between it's appropriately utilized for you know all patients or most patients um, so that is one of the the challenges and but also one of the great opportunities because it means that you know we have we're sitting at the precipice of what is a huge growth in inflection in the use of genetics and genomics and we're going to see that as having a profound impact on human health not just for that prevention but also to get to you know, a deeper understanding of what is causing the disease and thus a richer opportunity to improve how we treat disease because it's like you're getting to the root cause rather than just observing a symptom and then trying to treat this symptom. Let's talk a little bit about a very controversial subject regarding the, uh, the idea of using genetic information to do the genetic space selection. Uh, and I'd like to get your perspective around where we are on that, because I know there's some debates, the pros and cons. Uh, clearly, there is a pros for making sure certain disease could be filtered and screened, but then uh, screening for genetic disposition or even modifying the gene could be a, another topic by itself. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that subject? That's an area that's such an important question. It's really fraught with a lot of moral and ethical considerations. And, you know, for the most part, genomics is really utilized post-birth. So individuals who are here and how we think about uh, understanding disease and improving the disease or you know, diagnosis and improving treatment. Um, but it's also utilized heavily in reproductive health. And, you know, there is increasingly utilization and selection of an embryo to make sure you're having a healthy child. And this is where we start to get into the area of, you know, what should be selected for. And there are some genetic conditions that are so severe that, you know, typically they lead to not a healthy pregnancy, meaning the baby is not born, uh, or they can lead to death in the initial years of that individual's life. And so in those severe conditions, uh, you know, in general, they're, they're um, you know, and obviously there's religious considerations and other factors as well, uh, but the, the selection, if you're undergoing IVF to help find and select uh, you know, the, the embryo for, for a healthier child um, is widely applied today. And that's led to increased, you know, fertility and ability for individuals, um, you know, to have a healthy family. Um, but there's a lot of complexity, particularly when we start to think about editing our genes and um, the genome. And this is just at the very beginning of being utilized in improving um, care uh, for, you know, like sickle cell anemia, as an example. And what's powerful about the technology is it can actually cure disease. Uh, what is scary about the technology is, you know, do we understand the full downstream 
effects in editing the genome because as i just said we don't know everything about the genome and what is you know its role and function and implications in human health and so there is a lot of complexity there so if you think about also in positively i mean covid-19 vaccine wouldn't be here without intense work and contribution of uh, gene genomic understanding and being able to sequence the virus in a proper way to understand uh, where the spikes are, what, what, it, what it is. And I think we've seen a rapid development of vaccines that usually takes five to 10 years. And here we are within a year, we have vaccines that are rolling out. And I think people are taking those vaccines and they're all mRNA based. And it looks like it's working pretty well, but I'd like to get your perspective on this. Yeah, now you that is so right. And you know, we the other aspect that we were talking about earlier was data and sharing of data. And so one of the things that has really come through with COVID-19 is the rapid data sharing, first of the genomic sequence of the virus itself, uh, but that has really allowed us, you know, to not short circuit the path of, uh, you know, vaccine development, but to accelerate the path of vaccine development because of this more, you know, kind of deep understanding of, um, uh, you know, the virus itself. And so it, I see this as the first of what hopefully will follow, uh, you know, many more uh, kind of ways in which we can better utilize genomics in, you know, immunology and really accelerating, um, you know, the uh, being able to address this global pandemic, uh, but also, you know, sort of accelerating our, our advancement in the future for other disease areas and new viruses that could emerge. Uh, and even for this virus, as it begins to mutate, and we're seeing new variants enter, uh, that will require the increasing focus of the scientific community to be able to address uh, those new variants as well. And so you're, you're very right. That's been critical for our, our success. So uh, one of the things that also happened in this pandemic time, as we are all locked up and we're all working through distance, having a discourse with, uh, you know, conferencing through Zoom and others, uh, we learned to deal with that. And obviously one of the areas that I believe helped in medicine is telehealth in a way that you don't want to go to see a doctor, you don't want to go see a hospital, given the pandemic is going on. And I believe that uh, the whole telehealth area has really skyrocketed in terms of usage because people are forced to do it. And once you are forced to use technology, you're getting more comfortable with what's possible. And obviously that's creating more preventive rather than reactive. And that are maybe helping people to learn more about their bodies. And I think it's the same thing around maybe telegenetics. Can you tell us a little bit about virtual delivery of a genetic care, whether that is something that's gonna happen? Yeah, I mean, my company, Genomedical, has been focused on virtual delivery of genomics from day one. So we very quickly, at the beginning of the pandemic, really worked with a lot of health system partners to move them into virtual care uh, to be able to continue to support patients, you know, through our pandemic. And, you know, speaking more broadly, telehealth has advanced easily by, you know, five years, maybe even 10 years, just as a result of the forcing function of the pandemic. And um, if we've, it's caused both providers as well as patients to realize how much clinical care can be delivered virtually. Obviously not all clinical care because, you know, for surgery and many other uh, instances, you need to be directly in front of your provider. Uh, but for much of clinical care, we can uh, deliver care virtually. And in fact, what we hear from our patients as well as for providers, they, they really prefer virtual when available. And the reason being is one, you're much more uh, regiment in terms of schedule. So you're more on time, both providers and patients. Uh, you are also, you know, eliminating the logistics of having to go somewhere, wait in the waiting room, you know, all of that. And so it's all about efficiency and, you know, still continuing to maintain that quality of care. We've seen a rapid advancement.
it clearly you are in the part of data economy. And it sounds like a still very early stage of that early innings of data economy that are just with more data. The benefit of more data is that you will get more insight. Obviously, it requires, say, a lot more work, a lot more complexity, and a lot more discovery, which is a part of your journey. And I really want to thank you for your time today to sharing the, the journey that you're in, the mission you're driving, the teams you're driving with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Young. This was enjoyable. Thank you so much.